Israel cannot make as the object of its act the revenge of simply killing innocent people to make up for the killing of their innocent people. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today we're going to be exploring some big questions. Is war just? Is any war just? What would make a war just or unjust? What is a war crime? If a civilian dies, an innocent civilian dies in war, is that always a war crime? What about the Israeli-Gaza conflict? What about the accusations coming from both sides that war crimes are being committed? We're going to explore these questions and more in this very important episode with Dr. Robert George. Dr. Robert George is a professor of jurisprudence at Princeton University and has been there for several decades. He's also an ethicist, a bioethicist, and has served on the President's Council of Bioethics. He has written multiple books and has been a scholar that has traveled the world speaking on moral issues. He's someone that I admire for a lot of his work in the pro-life movement, and he has worked carefully on the just war issue, exploring how do we as Christians think about war, and how does any person of goodwill and reason think about war, especially in this era of modern warfare with atomic weapons and nuclear weapons and urban warfare. Did you know that most of the meat in the grocery store is not from the USA, even if it says USA on the label? Good Ranchers is the number one meat company in America for your meat, your poultry, and it is 100% sourced in the United States of America. Good Ranchers is the company of choice for my husband and I. It's where we order our meat and our poultry from, and the quality is better than what you're gonna find in the grocery store, and that's because these are ranchers, American ranchers, and farmers who are raising your product. So if you wanna have some delicious meat, delicious poultry, delicious seafood, check out Good Ranchers today. You can use the code LILA to get free express shipping and 30% off your first order. That's the code LILA. You can order it at goodranchers.com. That's goodranchers.com and use the code Lila at checkout for $30 off your order and free express shipping. All right. Well, I'm so delighted to have Dr. Robbie George on the podcast today. We're going to get into some really important topics, including just war theory. Dr. George, thanks for joining. Oh, it's a pleasure, Lila. Always good to be with you. So you have extensive background on moral philosophy and theology. You are a McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton, and you've also served on the President's Council of Bioethics. You're an author. You've done so much work on, on these issues. So I would love to first hear any more background you have in your study of just war theory and really the, the morality around war. Well, my areas of scholarship and teaching are philosophy of law, uh, moral and political philosophy, uh, bioethics, and civil liberties. So uh, as you can see, uh, just war theory touches all of those subjects in, uh, in one way or another. Uh, I've been working on these issues for my entire 39 years uh, as an academic. I uh, started in the fall of 1985 at, at, at Princeton, uh, and I've been here uh, ever since, and uh, my teaching has been in precisely uh, those areas. Uh, unfortunately, there are always very pressing issues. Uh, I say unfortunately because, of course, they are life and death issues, and wouldn't it be lovely if we didn't have to deal with life and death uh, problems? Uh, but we do, and there are whole bodies of thought, bodies, bodies of scholarship, uh, uh, schools of thought and philosophy dedicated to trying to think our way through the ethics of, of life and death, including uh, life and death and warfare. So let's start with just war theory. What is it and where it originated? It's a body of thought uh, about two things, really. What justifies going to war, where going to war is justified, if it ever can be justified. And then how can, uh, even in a justified war, how can decent people who are in charge of defending a population by force of arms conduct themselves in the conduct of the war in a way that is morally upright, in a way that is just. So there's, there are two real questions here. One is the justice of going to war. What justifies that, if anything? And then second, what is justified and unjustified in prosecuting a war? And what's the, where, did these, where did this theory first originate? Uh, it, of course, the thought about 
justice generally, and including justice in the in the use of force, uh, goes all the way back into antiquity. Uh, both the, the the Greek and Roman thinkers, uh, for example, uh, and also, of course, there are some reflections um, that are contained in the Hebrew Revelation and among Jewish thinkers. Uh, so the two streams that have been the principal uh, feeding streams of of Western philosophy pagan Athens and Rome on the one side, uh, Jerusalem on the other, uh, have fed thought in this area uh, as well. Probably the most important early Christian thinker, the most important thinker of antiquity on these questions is St. Augustine, uh, who really begins to wrestle in a serious way uh, with the question of uh, what is justified and unjustified when it comes to going to war and then in conducting a war. Uh, he, he's really deeper uh, in his thought about these questions than anyone who went before. And much of what has come to be known as just war theory was developed on the foundation of what uh, what Augustine originally put into place. So what contributions or potentially unique contributions would you say that Christianity, you know, via Augustine initially made to the the thought that had already been developed over the years in antiquity? Well, um, I, I wouldn't say necessarily that Christianity makes a unique contribution. Uh, it builds on and develops uh, what comes before from those those streams, from you know, Greece and Rome on the one side, and Jerusalem uh, on the other side. But the basic idea here, which Christianity profoundly affirms, is that human life has intrinsic and not merely instrumental value that each and every member of the human family is the bearer of profound, inherent, and equal dignity. Everyone's life is precious, no matter how weak, poor, dilapidated, uh, no matter social status, no matter race, no matter ethnicity, no matter sex, uh, everyone's life is precious and equally precious. And the roots of that, rather obviously, are in the teaching of the very first, very first uh, chapter of the very first book uh, in the Hebrew Bible, the book of Genesis, where we're taught that the human being, unlike the brute animals, unlike anything else in creation, the human being, though made from the mere dust of the earth, is nevertheless fashioned in the very image and likeness of the divine creator and ruler of all that is, in the very image and likeness of, of God. And so Jewish thinkers and then Christian thinkers wrestle with what that means, Lila. Well, how are we God-like? If, if that's the source of our fundamental dignity and our equality, how are we God-like? Well, it can't be that God has five fingers on each of two hands and hair on his head and a nose. Uh, God is immaterial. So it's got to be something else. Well, what is it? Uh, the great thinkers of these traditions have settled on the idea that what is godlike about us are our powers of reason and freedom. The things that really distinguish us from the brute animals, even the most intelligent of the brute uh, animals, dolphins and uh, rhesus monkeys and, and pigs, which turned out actually to be quite intelligent creatures. But they lack freedom of the will and rationality in the sense that uh, we find God exercising rationality uh, from the very beginning in the Bible, from Genesis 1. And that is the ability, exercising the, the capacity to envisage states of affairs that do not exist, to understand the intelligible point, the value, the worth of bringing them into existence, and then acting not on impulse or instinct like a brute animal, but rather freely on reasons one has to bring states of affairs into existence, to bring those states of affairs into existence. At, at each stage in the creation story, you'll recall, uh, uh, God looks at what he creates and uh, sees that it is good. Now, God's not surprised. Let me let you in on a little secret. God's not surprised to find out that they are good. Actually, God created them because he understood it would be good for them to exist. Uh, whether it's the birds of the air or the fish of the sea or the highest, the crown of his creation in the, uh, here on earth, and that is mankind made in his very image and, and likeness. So as image bearers, we all have profound, inherent, and equal dignity. All of our lives are precious. So just war theory begins from that er principle, as I call it, of all sound ethics, 
the principle of the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family. But sometimes we face situations where acting for the sake of something important will, or at least is likely, to result in harm and even death to somebody. Is that ever permissible? That's the question that, of course, we've got to answer. And specifically for the topic at hand today, is that ever permissible when it comes to self-defense or defense of innocent third parties? And here, St. Augustine, and then building on St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas in the high Middle Ages, and the, the, the great thinkers of uh, the Christian tradition since, the, the papal magisterium, the teaching of the popes, have all focused on developing this line of thought, trying to figure out when the use of force is, force is justified and unjustified, and uh, what kind of force can be used legitimately in prosecuting a, a just war. So the tradition is not pacifistic, strictly speaking. Now, there are Christian sects that are pacifistic. Uh, the Bruderhof, uh, uh, for example, I have great respect for them. And in justifying their pacifism, they would just point to the example of Jesus, who says, turn the other cheek. If, 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 if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. If someone uh, uh, takes your, your cloak, give him your robe uh, as well. Uh, they're not without an argument, our pacifist fellow Christians. But the Catholic tradition has not opted for pacifism, strictly speaking. It's rather held that when it comes to war and in some other areas, it is sometimes permissible to perform an act that will foreseeably result in harm or even death to another for the sake of a justifiable end where death is outside the scope of intention of the actor, where your real goal here is not getting a person dead, but where death is an unavoidable side effect of the otherwise justifiable act. Uh, this has been formalized in something that philosophers call the principle of double effect, that sometimes the same act will have two effects, the good one that is desired and the bad one that is, is not desired. Whether or not you use the language of double effect, what matters here is the intentional structure of a choice. Self-defense has been justified by St. Augustine, by St. Thomas Aquinas, by the papal magisterium, by the teachings of the church, uh, has been justified on the ground that in defending ourselves against an unjust attack or, against, or defending a third party against an unjust attack on that third party, we're not strictly speaking seeking the death of the assailant. We're trying to stop the attack. We're trying to defend the innocent from the unjustified attack. If we can do that without killing the person, then our obligation is to do that. If the only way we can do that is by performing an act which foreseeably will result in his death, then we're justified in doing that. Not because we're intending the death again, strictly speaking, if we closely analyze the intentional structure of the choice, but because we're willing to accept the death as a side effect of an otherwise uh, justified act. Um, everything in this domain depends on the goodness of the will. It, it depends on the intention. The basic idea can be captured this way. You can never use another person as a mere means. Persons are ends in themselves. They're not mere means. And so, for example, even where you're justified in stopping an assailant by the use of potentially deadly force. Let's say you shoot at someone attacking an innocent third party. Let's say you shoot at an Hamas terrorist who's attacking a baby. And you think you're going to kill him. And you knock him down and you disable him, but you don't kill him. You can now capture him. So the question is, well, can I finish him off? Can I kill him? Because he's a bad guy, because he was attacking this baby. And here, the tradition and the teaching of the church says, no, that is directly willing his death. And you can't do that. So if you've disabled him, you've achieved everything that you legitimately sought to achieve. 
without actually killing him. So you can't just finish him off. You're not justified in killing him. That's why the Catholic tradition has always said that uh, you can never embrace, even in justified warfare, a take no prisoners philosophy, that you're just going to kill every, every, every enemy uh, combatant. Now, there's another and related principle here, Lila, that it's important for people understand, to understand, and that's the principle of non-combatant immunity. Even again, where you're justified in using force against an unjust aggressor, you cannot attack the aggressing side's civilian population. Now here again, sometimes the death, deaths of innocent civilians or other harm to innocent civilians short of death will be an unavoidable side effect of an act or choice that has as its precise object not the death of those non-combatants, but rather uh, stopping the assailant. And those can be justified, and we'll, we'll talk in a minute about some considerations that will bear on whether it's justified. We're going to get into something called proportionality. But lay that aside for a minute. Right now, I'm just making the point that um, sometimes a justified act to stop an aggressor will have bad consequences, including sometimes lethal consequences, for innocent third parties in the aggressor's community. And that can sometimes be justified because, again, you're not intending death, strictly speaking. That is, you're not intending death as an end and you're not intending death as a means to an end. You're in this third category of volition, not, not intending as end, not intending as means, but accepting as a side effect of another was justified. Now, to some people, that's going to sound like nitpicking and like excuse making and, you know, fancy philosophical justifications for uh, using violence, which really should never be used to, to strict pacifists. That's the way it sounds. But I myself think the church is right about this. I think the tradition is right about this. Um, we're, we're, we're right to defend innocent people, even by the force of arms. But there are moral norms that bear on when and how we do that. So to clarify the distinctions here, and I know you're going to get to proportionality, um, you know, it can't be for retribution. So no just war is fought for retribution. Well, can we it stop right be... there, uh, Lisa, yes, uh, Lila, uh, yeah. ju just for a minute? Well, yeah. uh, this is a change in the tradition that is um, relatively recent. So mm -hmm. If we go back to the early period of the development of the theory, to Augustine's time, uh, and forward for many, many centuries, uh, many leading authorities believe that war could be justified in A, self-defense, or defense of a third party, and B, for punitive purposes, to punish an unjust aggressor. And now, there were also norms about what you could do to punish an unjust aggressor. But war was considered at least potentially legitimate as a form of retribution in the sense of punishment. And purely punishment, no rehabilitation pure, intended here. Pure, this is purely just punishment. like That's you know, right. a bit of an eye for an eye mentality with that, with that secondary uh, potential justification for, for a just well, war. Well, retribution, even in this period I'm talking about, uh, has to be distinguished from revenge. So, so a, a, a retributive war is not a war of revenge. It's not an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. Its, its aim is not emotional satisfaction. That's what revenge is all about. It's to restore an order of justice allegedly distorted by the unjust aggressor's act of, of aggression. That's, that's the classic retributive justification for criminal punishment. And it's embraced by the church to this day as the justification for, for criminal, uh, criminal punishment. And in earlier times, it was thought to be a justification, a potentially legitimate justification for war. But the 20th century popes uh, have very strongly moved away from that and have limited justified war to wars of self-defense or defense of a third party. And it's no longer taught by the Catholic Church that wars can be justified for punitive purposes or retributive uh, purposes, and why is speaking. that? Why why that move away? I mean, even uh, Pope Francis, he had in a footnote in Frat uh, Fratelli Tutti, he says Saint Augustine, who forged a concept of just war uh, that we no longer uphold in our own day. So he's you know just kind of yeah. saying there in passing, we don't uphold 
St. Augustine's just war theory as he as he spoke it, and is he referring to the retribution ret, retributive aspect, or what is what do you yeah, think he's referring it's a, to? Yeah, it's exactly what he's referring to. Yep, it's exactly what he's referring to. And here, there's no no innovation with Pope Francis. He's in line here with Pope Benedict, uh, uh, Pope John Paul II, Pope Paul VI, Pope, Pope Pius the Twelfth, Pope Pius the Eleventh, and so forth. Um, uh, I think what's going on here is a deeper appreciation of the sanctity of life principle and the priority of the sanctity of life principle. Uh, that where life itself is not at stake, then you can never resort to potential lethal force. That even otherwise valid retributive purposes are not sufficient given the priority of the sanctity of life. And I think this is a very good example of how the church's teaches de teaching develops. That is not by kind of radically changing things or granting permissions where permissions were previously not granted or anything like that, but by deepening our appreciation of a principle that's at the core of the church's mm -hmm. teaching. If we uh, read, um, of course, the great 19th, the greatest authority on the development of the church's doctrine, uh, the, the 19th century uh, English uh, theologian uh, and later uh, cardinal, uh, John Henry Newman, this is exactly the kind of thing Newman has in mind uh, when he uh, discusses the way the church's doctrine can legitimately legitimately uh, develop. Now, that's that sometimes misguided people seize on the reality that the church's doctrine can develop to propose that the church abandon teachings that are firm and constant and simply you know can't be can't be revised because their their teaching is uh, authenticated as true guaranteed as, as as true by the magisterium of the of the church where the charism of the church's magisterium has been exercised in such a way that we can be confident uh, that uh, that this is so um, but Robbie, do you, do you think the the move from retribution as a as justified you know by the you know by the church really in the last century is in part because of the the sheer carnage of World War One and World War Two? Oh, I don't have and any wanting it to be avoided. I don't have any doubt about it mm -hmm. that uh, World War One in particular is a, in World War in World War One um, at the time of World War One. The Catholic Church is still largely a European institution. And Europeans were focused on the unprecedented violence and carnage, unprecedented of the First World War. No one had ever seen anything like this uh, before. And uh, as Dr. Johnson famously said of the prospect of a hanging in the morning, it concentrates your mind. And I think it did concentrate the mind of the uh, magisterium of the church, of the, the bishops in communion with the pope. It concentrated their minds on this question of what does the principle of the sanctity of human life demand of us? And I think it was out of that reflection that they decided that, you know what, our, our doctrine here is not strict enough. It's, it needs to be tightened. And that tightening excludes going to war using lethal violence for any purpose that does not really involve the protection of the sanctity of human life. Start your day with America's number one pro-life coffee company, Seven Weeks Coffee. Seven Weeks Coffee is gourmet, organic coffee, specialty roast. They have the kinds, any kind that you could like, from medium to dark to light roast. All of it is ethically sourced. And the best part about Seven Weeks Coffee, the reason I drink it every morning, is yes, it's superior to Pete's or Starbucks or any of the other brands you might find. But in addition, sevenweekscoffee.com gives back 10% total of all their revenue, not just profits, to pro-life pregnancy centers. So sign up now, go to sevenweekscoffee.com, buy your coffee, get it for a friend, support the pro-life movement, drink a delicious hot cup of coffee, and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order.
So you, I know, are going to get to proportionality, mm -hmm. but I want to maybe do the risky thing of getting very practical here and applying this to, you know, I, everyone's mind is on the Israel-Gaza war yeah. that's unfolding. Uh, just horrific. Obviously, the stories coming out from the region and a lot of passionate opinions on many sides about the conflict. It's been, of course, an ongoing conflict. Uh, so if we could dare to do this, can we get into maybe, you know, the events of the last 10 days um, going on two weeks here, you know, for starting with the Hamas's, you know, unprecedented brutal attacks against Israeli citizens. They respond by saying we must crush Hamas. I mean, obviously, in the heat of war, there's a lot of um, rhetoric and some, you know, I think there was some retributive uh, focus. Let's just destroy them all. Um, but certainly it's a self-defense measure at large because they want to protect their their people from this ever happening again. What can you? What can we learn looking at what's unfolding right now in the Israel-Gaza war about the proper application or the improper application of just war theory principles? Well, the attacks of October 7th were literally unprovoked attacks on innocent human beings, including children, babies, elderly uh, people. Can you? I'm going to pause right there because I know many folks listening who are very sympathetic to the cause of, you know, quote unquote, free Palestine will say they were not unprovoked. I mean, this is the argument coming from many people on the left and the right saying, well, Israel has, you know, taken the land. This is the accusation. And therefore, this was, you know, an it was a provoked a, a provocation that's been ongoing from Israel. They've been, you know, tough and harsh on civilians in Gaza and the West Bank. And therefore, yes, it wasn't right for terrorists to behead children, but it was also not unprovoked. I think that is an argument coming from everyone from, you know, heads of student associations at Harvard, as you yourself have uh, called out on Twitter. And then people, on, I've seen it on the right as well as the left. The babies that were butchered by Hamas did not provoke the attacks by Hamas. I say to those people, enough with these rationalizations. This is outrageous. Those babies were innocent. Those elderly people were innocent. Those young people uh, at the music festival were innocent. Uh, they, their lives were treated as mere objects. They were, they were treated worse than animals. Uh, they did not provoke this attack on them. They were not aggressors in any way, shape, or form. So I have no patience, Lila, with this foolishness of saying this was a provoked attack. It was not a provoked attack. The people who they butchered were not provoking anybody. Uh, if, if I'm angry at you and I decide I'm going to go and shoot your grandmother, that's not a provoked attack by your grandmother. Uh, that's just an outrageous act of terrorism by me. And I'm responsible for that. And no one should try to rationalize my doing it by saying, well, you know, Lila did some horrible thing uh, to, to this guy. No, no. So we have to be clear headed about this stuff. And we can't put up with the nonsense. And I don't care whether the nonsense comes from some organization at Harvard or not. That's irrelevant to me. Nonsense is nonsense. Now, some of these same uh, voices say, you know, what Hamas is, you know, responding to, yeah, those acts maybe were wrong, but Israel, uh, you know, the IDF has targeted civilians. You know, there's a lot of accusations that really any warfare in Gaza is the targeting of civilians since it's two million people strong. They say a million of them are children. What is there? Is there any appropriate response militarily? from Israel in any kind of invasion or strikes on Gaza when civilians are everywhere? Well, uh, of course, Israel is, in my view, required to abide by the principles of just warfare. Now, uh, it, you know, whether those responsible for decision making in Israel uh, accept my version of justified uh, warfare or not, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but I know what mine are, and I'm going to judge them in the same way that I judge Hamas by reference to what I think is true. And what I think is true is in line with what the Catholic Church says is true, although I think that the principles that are proclaimed by the Catholic Church here are principles that are fully validated uh, by reason, even apart from any question of uh, revealed religion or ecclesiastical uh, authority. So I would hope that as a, as a matter of at least shared rationality, even if not shared religious faith, uh, that everyone 
uh, Palestinian, uh, Muslim, uh, Israeli, Jewish uh, would subscribe to these principles because I think they're true. And those principles would say, do say, that while a military response is justifiable to the kind of violence that uh, was perpetrated against innocent Israeli Jews and others on October 7th, there are rules, there are moral norms constraining what Israel can legitimately do in response. Um, they cannot target civilians. And what does now, that, that mean? I think that, that's, that the, means, that's the big debate, right? Yeah, what that does means, it mean to target when you know, let's say, a civilian is in the vicinity of where the strike will hit? And this could be because your opposition is using them as human shields. Uh, there's no other way to maybe accomplish your military mm -hmm. objective of destroying the munitions pile or the headquarters of your, uh, you know, of your foe. And so what, what do you do? What is the just action in the case of, you know, a warfare that's urban and warfare that involves human shields? Yep. Okay. So first, let's just be clear, right, you know, to clear out the easy part, um, Israel cannot make as the object of its act, the revenge of simply killing innocent people to make up for the killing of their innocent people. And by innocent, we mean non-combatants. And that includes people who sympathize with Hamas and even people who sympathize with the violence. Sympathizing with the violence of Hamas does not make a Palestinian a combatant. Some people want to think that it does, but the truth is that it doesn't. And this whole tradition backs me up. On this, it doesn't. So you cannot deliberately target non-combatants. And you're not turned into a combatant simply by sympathizing with the bad guys. Israel says, and I see no reason to, to doubt them, we'll have to look at the evidence as it comes in, but Israel says that it is not targeting uh, non-combatants. We, we had a story just yesterday claiming that Israel attacked uh, a hospital uh, with with no justification uh, uh, in the sense that the hospital was being used as a, a place for human shields. Well, it now seems that story is completely false and that the hospital was not attacked by the uh, Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, it, uh, it was the uh, victim of a bomb or some sort of an attack, some sort of a weapon that was used uh, by Hamas militants themselves and happened to fall uh, I, I'm assuming inadvertently, uh, on, a, on a, a Christian hospital, a, ba a Baptist uh, a hospital. Or, or other Palestinian militants. They're saying it might not have been actually a Hamas, Hamas command, yeah. but another warring, a warring group. But it, it begs the question, you know, what if there had been, you know, what if okay. Hamas's headquarters had been in that hospital? I'm with you. And they okay. chose, they asked them to evacuate, you know, and there are, you know, there's lots of obviously... In the accounts of the last week, Israel has repeatedly been asking the people of Gaza to evacuate. Of course, the humanitarian uh, you know, process can be very rough. I mean, there's a response from some in the global community saying, how dare you ask them to evacuate? There's nowhere for them to go. Uh, so there's that you know, question, very thorny. And then the question of the hospital, how can they evacuate all these people if they choose not to? Is it still justified okay. to bomb the hospital knowing there's people in it? Yeah. It can be legitimate, it can be morally legitimate, to bomb a place that you know has uh, non-combatants, has civilians, has innocent people, for, for in the sense that we're using the term innocent here, as innocent people, uh, indeed many of them, where your object is a legitimate military object and where the act and the harm that you foresee being caused by the act is proportionate to the legitimate goal that you're seeking to achieve. That is stopping the assailant, that is disabling or disarming uh, the, the unjust attacker, the, the aggressor. But there are a couple of things here that you know, are very fact specific, fact dependent. You, you, you can't abstractly resolve them. You need to know what the facts are. You need to know, in fact, has the justified party done everything it can legitimately reasonably do to minimize civilian deaths uh, has it notified the civilian population of the attack that's about to come if it could do so without undermining its military objective uh, has it done its best to enable 
those civilians to get out of the way. As you say here, it's very difficult in some cases to see exactly how innocent Palestinians, non-combatant Palestinians, are going to get out of the territory where they're being used as human shields. And Hamas is definitely using this tactic. They know the Israelis feel constrained to try to avoid civilian casualties. Hamas does not. They deliberately killed a whole bunch of innocent people on October 7th. That, that was not a, a, an avoidable, uh, uh, unavoidable tragedy. Um, uh, but they know the Israelis, Hamas knows the Israelis want to minimize civilian casualties. So they are incentivized and they act on the incentive to use their own people as human shields. Mm-hmm. Palestinian deaths help Hamas. That's the key Brutal. thing we got to keep in mind. The more Palestinian deaths, the better for Hamas because it makes the Israelis look like bad guys. And it diminishes the authority of Israel or the standing of Israel in the eyes of the world, which will then put more and more pressure on Israel to stop in its defense of itself. But Lila, I need to get to this point that you keep Please bringing do. me up to the uh, bring me up to the verge of to the ledge, yes, uh, to for the it. ledge of, and that's proportionality. What does proportionality yes. mean? I said a word about it a, 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 a moment ago, and now I need to fill in more details. Um, uh, let's say the following: Let's say that the bad guys who are shelling your cities from mountains across the border in their territory. Um, place their uh, rocket launchers or cannons in uh, camps occupied by their own um, uh, non-combatant civilians, okay? If you, on the behalf of the good guys, if the government of the good guys says, you know what, we're going to have to knock out those cannons or those rocket launchers, which means we're going to have to bomb those camps that have civilians in them. That can be legitimate. If you do everything you can to minimize civilian deaths, if you try to give the civilians ways to get out of the camp, but sometimes you can't, there's just no way to do it. Let's say, for example, the bad guys ring the camp with soldiers with AK-47s and shoot any civilians who try to leave the camp. So they're literally holding their own people hostage. In principle, you could bomb the camp, not to kill the civilians. You're, 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 you wish you didn't have to. You wish you couldn't. You wish that they could survive, but in order to knock out the military launcher. But proportionality here really does implicate numbers. So let's say that the, that the rocket launchers from the camps shelling your cities are not actually killing anybody. But they are frightening people. They're keeping people up at night. They're causing great consternation consternation and anxiety. Well, that's not a good enough justification to bomb the camps, even though your goal would be to knock out the rocket launchers and cut down the anxiety of your people and enable people to get some sleep at night and remove people from, uh, try to minimize the fear people are living in. It still wouldn't be justified because it's not proportionate. You you can't weigh those considerations against the actual lives of the people who would be killed, not not as directly intended deaths, but nevertheless would be killed, who's, who would be collateral damage, as they sometime call, sometimes call it. I, I don't really like that phrase. It's too bloodless uh, when there's real blood, there's real flesh and blood human beings here. Um, but let's say that to change the, the change the uh, example now, the hypothetical example, let's say that every few days a person is killed, okay, from the rocket launchers that are, are in the enemy camps. Now are you justified in, in bombing the camps in order to knock out the rocket launchers even though you know you're going to kill the civilians? Well, here it depends on how many civilians do you think you're going to kill? If in order to save six members of your own population, six innocent people of your own, you have to perform an act that you know foreseeably will result in 20,000 deaths of innocent uh, uh, people in the camps, no, that's not proportionate. It's not justified. There you have to absorb, morally speaking, you have to absorb those deaths on your side because there's not a morally justified way of avoiding it. But, and is this, is, but 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 yeah, one 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 way to test it, and and of course what we could do with the hypothetical cases you know being being a, a philosopher 
Um, I spend a lot of my time with hypothetical cases. Mm -hmm. And what we would do, Lila, if you and I were, were sitting in a philosophy classroom, is we'd start adjusting the numbers. So instead of six against 20,000, it's 600 against 15,000. And then it's you know, uh, 1,200 against uh, 2,000. And pretty soon, you know, it's uh, 1,501 against 1,499. And, and, um, and at that point, it's hard to make judgments. But here, I think, is a good heuristic device. I think what we need to ask ourselves, if we're the, on the just side and the unjust aggressor is attacking us, I think we have to, have to ask ourselves, would we perform the act we're considering performing with its consequences in terms of so-called collateral damage if the people in the camps weren't foreigners, but were rather our own prisoners of war? Mm. It's a Since, good, a, good, uh, yeah. a good question to ask to help yeah. really weigh, are we doing our best here? A exactly right. And, and that, that does pay, uh, that pays honor, a proper honor. Mm -hmm to the principle of the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of each and every human being, which is where this whole analysis begins. We go right back to first principles. If we really believe in the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of each and every member of the human family, then in doing our calculations in terms of proportionality, it's going to, we're going to be indifferent. We have to hold ourselves as indifferent as to the nationality uh, or ethnicity, or race, or what have you, sex of the people who will be the, quote, collateral damage, unquote. And it does go specifically, you know, back to the Israel-Gaza war right now. There are 200 hostages, most of them Israeli, uh, held likely in Gaza, you know, maybe in that hospital that, you know, Israel was accused of bombing. It comes out now Israel didn't bomb it. But, uh, you know, in perhaps near the buildings or perhaps on top of the targets where Hamas is, you know, Hamas knows will yeah. be targets just to, you know, have the horror continue, the terror continue of Israel inadvertently killing its own people um, by attacking Hamas. And so I think that is an important thing to remember in with Israel's um, aggressions at this point is that the, their people that are there too. It's not just the Palestinian people um, right now in Gaza. Um, um, it's a but very, I, but very I do good wanna, point, Lila. Yeah. Very good but point. But I do want to ask another question, you know, from, again, the Palestinian perspective. And again, not all Palestinians are against even Israel's invasion of Gaza. You know, 20% of Israel is Palestinian. Uh, so there's many Palestinians who are very sympathetic to the IDF and, and Israel. But of course, there are many who believe they're, they've been greatly wronged here. And I did want to ask another question. And this is also connected to, you know, even the United States action in World War II with the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, you know, is there another option besides taking out the military, the, 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 the missiles, the, you know, the headquarters of the enemy that is heavily focused instead on defense? So as an example for what just happened here in, with the Israel-Gaza war that's, uh, that's escalating, what if Israel, instead of invading Gaza, and this would be, of course, an argument from some on the opposition, uh, just sh shored up their defenses, shored up their borders, made the Iron Dome even better, made those uh, walls indestructible. They were destroyed, of course, by Hamas fighters who piled over them, you know, 1,500 of them. But what if they had succeeded in keeping out the terrorists? And what if instead of invading Gaza, they just get better at their own defense to keep terrorists out? Well, obviously, that would be a good thing to do, um, but it's not necessarily a morally required thing to do. Uh, it's a very complex uh, situation. Uh, judgments of fact need to be made that uh, we're certainly not, you and I sitting here and our other American uh, fellow citizens are not in a position uh, to make. And really, in a certain sense, nobody's in a permission in a position to make because you're guessing. <laughs> and of you just course. have to and use I'm, your I'm best saying this as credential. The giving you the hard, you know, the hard questions and accusations coming from the defenders of, you know, Palestinian resistance at this point. Yeah. Um, I, I think that there are difficult prudential judgments that do need to be made. And by, by definition, difficult prudential judgments can be gotten wrong. You know, we're not, we're not infallible. Um, it's inevitable that we're going to make mis some mistakes and other people are just like us. Other, other people of goodwill are going to be prone to mistakes just like we do. So uh, we are. So, you know, I don't want to dictate to uh, Israeli decision makers, uh, 
given the circumstances of their own people, their own hostages being uh, being held, their their vulnerability to attack from so many sides, their history of being under attack uh, so many times. I want to dictate. Don't want to dictate to them what the correct strategy has to be. I do, though, want to defend the the norms, the the moral norms of just war uh, theory, which I think are as binding on them as they are on anyone else. And for the most part, uh, Israeli spokesmen uh, say that they share those norms. They believe in those uh, those same norms. I, I doubt that there's a perfect agreement between uh, their thinking and, and, and our thinking, but there's a very substantial uh, agreement on it. Now there are factual questions. Uh, is that, are those officials telling the truth? Uh, uh, have there been circumstances in which uh, civilians have actually been targeted? Not, not, not where it's collateral damage, but actually been targeted. Well, those allegations have been made. There have certainly been cases in which Israeli citizens or soldiers have engaged in terrorist acts against Palestinians. That's that everybody agrees that that has happened. Um, but Israel has not celebrated those people. It has, where possible, disciplined or punished uh, those those people. So I don't think there's a, a moral symmetry uh, here. Although you know, the, the, Israel and Israelis are like America and Americans. You know, we not only do things, make mistakes, sometimes we do things that are wrong. And we can't justify it when Israel or America does things that are does things that are wrong. But I think you've done a wonderful job helping clear up some of the uh, moral equivalence that has been made that is improper, you know, yeah. between uh, Hamas fighters and obviously uh, Israel's response right now. I know we I know we have some time left here. I, I, I am really curious on your thoughts on the use of the atomic bomb in World War II, because yeah. that's highly controversial, I know, in uh, Christian and non-Christian circles. Uh, you know, should we have dropped that bomb? It killed uh, many, many civilians. What, what's your take on that? Uh, I have to say that I think that the bombing, uh, not only of Nagasaki, but also of Hiroshima, uh, and the terror bombing of Dresden uh, in Germany, I think those bombings were unjustified. That's a hard thing to say, uh, because uh, at least in the case of the bombing, the first bombing uh, in Japan, the bombing of Hiroshima, uh, it did shorten the war. Um, it and, and it probably uh, was the single most important thing that prevented the need for an American or allied invasion and occupation of uh, Japan, which would have been brutal with many lives lost. But uh, at least those of us who are Catholic or who subscribe, uh, whether we're Catholic or not, to the just war uh, tradition, we strongly reject the philosophy of ethical decision making known as utilitarianism. That's the philosophy that says any act can be justified, no matter how horrific in itself, if the net consequences of doing it are better than the consequences of not doing it. You can perform the act or should perform the act that overall and in the long run will produce the best net proportion of benefit to, to, to harm, however benefit and harm are, are defined, or in the in the in the less precise words of the founder of the utilitarian tradition, uh, the British thinker, Jeremy Bentham. Uh, you should do the act that will produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number. I can think of no theory other than utilitarianism under which the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima and Dresden would be justified because the object of those bombings was to terrorize the population of Japan and Germany in such a way that it would force the leadership of those countries to relent and to surrender. Um, we were on the right side in those fights, <laughs> battling against uh, the, the uh, uh, Tojo and Hitler. We were on the right side. They were the bad guys. We were the, we were the good guys. Um, but that doesn't mean everything we did was justified. And I'm afraid that deliberately attacking civilians, babies, unborn babies, grandmothers, in Nagasaki and Hiroshima and Dresden was not justified. Now, someone will respond. It could be someone in my own family that they might say, well, Professor George, your, your father, who was serving at that time uh, with the infantry in Normandy and Brittany in World War II, your father would have been shipped over to Japan and probably killed in, um, in an invasion and occupation because many, many American soldiers would have been. 
and uh, brutally, right? And I brutally, mean, brutally killed. Him. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you look at the treatment of the of the Chinese and others uh, by the Japanese armed forces, yes, absolutely brutally. Um, uh, but that doesn't change the moral equation. The fact that I wouldn't be here today, or that my father wouldn't, you know, because my father would have been killed, um, doesn't change the moral equation, and it doesn't suddenly justify the unjustifiable moral theory known as utilitarianism. If there is a moral theory that is antithetical, absolutely antithetical to everything the Catholic Church teaches, the Catholic faith teaches, it is utilitarianism. <laughs> so uh, the it, and it's, it's basically captured in what your mom and my mom taught you and taught me. Uh, and that is even a very, 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 very good end doesn't justify a bad means, even if it's only a little bit of a bad means. Uh, certainly not if it's a great bad means, but a good end doesn't justify a bad means. Both our end and the means we use to achieve that end must be morally good. That's what we as Catholics believe. Now, that, that that's a hard teaching for a lot of people to accept. A lot of people will say, well, look, if that's Catholic teaching, that you can never do evil, even that good might come of it, then, you know, I'm not going to be a Catholic or I can't sign up with the Catholic side on on these things because sometimes you just have to do uh, things that are really bad uh, because not doing them creates a situation or allows a situation to obtain that's really, really, really very much, very much worse. I can understand that. I've argued with people my entire career who were formally uh, committed to utilitarianism, such as my colleague at Princeton. Uh, Peter Singer, who's the the world's most mm -hmm. famous contemporary utilitarian, but uh, honestly, pro I can't. Pro infanticide. Uh, mm -hmm. Pro yes, yeah, pro abortion, pro infanticide, mm -hmm. justified on justified on uh, on uh, utilitarian grounds. Uh, but I'm I'm uh, you know I I stand fast on on this. I I think the utilitarian theory is wrong. I can go into detail, Lila, if you want me to, on why I think the utilitarian theory is uh, is wrong. But I do think it is wrong, and we have to stick. To to the idea that there are certain things that we cannot do, we can never do, even for the sake of really, really wonderful consequences or avoiding really, really dreadful consequences. And central among those things is the principle of no direct killing of innocent human beings. No killing of an innocent human being, either as an end, because you're angry at him or hostile to him, or as a means to an end. Because and you to want clarify, when when you say no direct, of course, you know, in the case of a missile strike, that directly, one of its direct effects is the killing of a civilian that was used as a human shield by your your opponent. But by direct, you mean the intention of the act was not to kill the civilian; it was to destroy the enemy headquarters or whatever you know that object was. Yeah. So uh, direct or indirect here refers to the intentional structure of the choice. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't uh, refer to what's going on, strictly speaking, in the external world, the world external to the actor. It's about what you are setting your will to do. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's precisely in setting our will one way or another with respect to the human goods that are in play, like the good of human life, when it comes to decision making, that we form our character, that we either strengthen ourselves as people of good character or damage ourselves as people as bad character. We integrate into our character, into our very selves, the principles of our action. And that's why intention is, is of such critical importance here. But we have to be careful not to misunderstand intention in a way that would uh, cause us to slip into utilitarianism. Everylife.com is America's pro-life diaper company. If you're a new parent, a grandparent, a happy, happy uncle or aunt, or your best friend just had a baby, get them Every Life diapers. Not only are these ethically sourced, best in quality diapers and wipes, but this is a pro-life company. Everylife.com is America's pro-life diaper company. So that means they give back part of their revenue to the pro-life cause, to pregnancy resource centers, and to groups like Live Action, your very own pro-life group. And they also love babies and are pro-life. So go to everylife.com Order your diapers and wipes for your friend or for your own family. They have a great subscription service. The quality is better than honest. Go to everylife.com and use the code LILA10 at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com and use the code LILA10 at checkout for 10% off your order. And and back to, you know, it's such a great distinction you're making between utilitarianism and the the many, um, you know, the, the, the great work that's put into 
properly weighing proportionality when it comes to just or unjust actions taken during war. And of course, the war itself has to be just, and then the actions in that war, uh, in addition, need to be just um, to the best of the prudential decision making that you know the the the. Um, participants can do. Uh, but, you know, back to the example of using the atomic bomb in Japan, if theoretically, you know, the only way to cripple physical military targets, uh, you know, for whatever reason, and again, this theoretical might we throw out right away because, yeah. you know, it doesn't work, uh, was, but let's just say that all of their military prowess was put in, you know, Nagasaki. And to destroy those targets, you know, it needed the level of an atomic bomb. We warned civilians to leave, you know, if possible. And at the end of the day, we still dropped that bomb. But there was that specific intention and goal. You know, could it have been? Is it possible for dropping an atomic bomb on a city to be just? Yeah. Uh, yes, it would. I mean, there's nothing special about the type of um, um, armament. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, or ordinance uh, uh, that it's conventional rather than nuclear isn't what matters. Dresden was not nuclear, but it suffered from the same, the bombing of, the terror bombing of the people of Dresden, non-combatants, babies, unborn babies, Brutal. grandmothers, uh, yeah. you know, was just as bad as the bombing of uh, Hiroshima, uh, despite the fact that the weapons used were ordinary ordinance and not, not nuclear nuclear weapons. So it's not the question of the, the determining factor is not whether it's nuclear or, uh, or not nuclear. It's all about whether you're setting your will on the destruction of the life of that innocent human being. That's really what it comes down to. It's the same question that we have when it comes to abortion, euthanasia, infanticide. What's wrong with those things, even if good consequences can come of them, What's wrong with them is that they violate the principle of no direct killing of innocent human beings. They treat a precious human life as, it's, as if it's a mere instrument, a mere object to somebody else's ends. Um, that's not what human beings are. <laughs> human beings have inherent value from the very earliest moment of their existence through to the end of their lives. So in vying for this principle of non-combatant immunity, in rejecting utilitarianism, I'm arguing for the thing that gives us the teaching we uphold, not only on just war, but when it comes to any form of killing, when it comes to euthanasia, when it comes to abortion, when it comes to embryo destructive research, when it comes to infanticide, especially infanticide, which you know, I, I, I worry about increasingly people willing, being willing to justify of, of uh, so-called defective infants, cognitively disabled um, uh, people. Um, we, we need to stand by this principle. There really is a consistent ethic of life. That's really true. I mean, sometimes that concept has been abused, a, a seamless garment of life, a consistent ethic of life. But the correct understanding of that and the understanding of, uh, uh, under which it is a correct principle is, is this. You can't do something. You morally, legitimately cannot do something if it involves directly setting your will against the life of this human being. Unborn baby, embryo in a in a in a vitro in vitro, uh, newborn baby, cognitively disabled newborn baby, elderly person with Alzheimer's disease or in a coma, non-combatant. Whether that non-combatant is a Japanese grandmother, uh, a, um, a Palestinian baby. Uh, a, uh, a, a German uh, non-combatant, it doesn't matter. Uh, all lives are equal and all lives are precious and inherently so. And you can't do a calculation about that. Now, uh, Lila, I should, I should just make sure everyone is clear on one thing that people sometimes misunderstand. Sometimes people misunderstand proportionality as being a utilitarian calculation. It's not. Here it's important to see that before we even get to the question of proportionality, there is a threshold question. The threshold question is this, does the act amount to a direct attack on an innocent human life? Does it amount to treating the life of the human being in question as a mere means? Uh, does it amount to willing the death of that person whether as an end in itself 
or as a means to some other end, as opposed to accepting the death of that person as a side effect, that third form of, of volition. And it's only when you've established that the act in question is not an act of direct killing, that the death, if it comes, would be a side effect, that you even then reach the next question of, well, is it proportionate? And then we've got the question of fundamental fairness. And heuristic devices like the one I suggested to you, considering whether we would do the same thing if the civilians whose lives are in jeopardy were our own POWs rather than uh, people of another um, uh, ethnicity or nationality, that, then that, that kind of consideration becomes, becomes relevant. I can see the rationalization, uh, Robbie, from people who would defend, you know, the firebombing of Dresden or defend, you know, the use of the atomic bomb in Japan by saying, well, the direct goal wasn't to terrorize or harm those civilians. We just wanted to get the militaries to, to, to give up, to surrender. Uh, what would you say to that defense of what you've, I think, you know, rightly called utilitarian and unjust uh, yeah. war crimes? Uh, there you just do the following thought experiment. Um, how is it that you get the leadership of the country to relent or surrender. It's precisely by getting the civilians dead. If you don't get the civilians dead, you haven't achieved your goal. <laughs> That's different from, let's say, bombing an enemy camp where you've got civilians in the camp, but the rocket launcher or the cannon is also in the camp. There, let's say you anticipate, you imagine, you suppose that, well, look, if we bomb the camp, we're going to kill 500 civilians. We, we, don't, we don't want to kill them. We, we hope that they wouldn't die. But our best guess is when we bomb that camp, 500 people are going to die. But we got to do it in order to knock out the rocket launcher. Now, let's say that, that they do it and they knock out the rocket launcher. But their calculations were off. And as a matter of fact, they don't kill anybody. Have they accomplished everything they set out to accomplish? Or do they say, oh, darn, nobody died? No, they've accomplished absolutely everything they set out to accomplish. But if you're trying to terrorize a civilian population in order to bring the leadership of the country to surrender, you've got to get people dead. If you drop the bomb and it doesn't go off and nobody dies, or you drop the bomb and it goes off and miraculously nobody dies, you haven't achieved your goal. Mm. It's that simple. It's a great, a great distinction, and I think so important because in the, in these days of war, we are in, you know, facing. There's a new war, obviously, in Israel and in Gaza. But the idea of collateral damage can mean two things. You know, the utilitarian can talk about collateral damage, and the just war actor can talk about collateral damage. And in one case, the damage was unintended, and you know, not a, not because of the direct action of the military. In another case, it was, and one is totally wrong, and the other can be justified. Very good. I, I, I made it through class, uh, Robbie. We made it through class. Uh, this has been so good. You're a star so student, I, Lila. You're a star student. I, <laughs> it's been so excellent. We, we, I know our um, our audience really appreciates it, and you know, we're this is something that we've begun to talk about more in the podcast. And now more than ever, these moral distinctions are important. Any final words? I mean, particularly on Israel Gaza for the proper way to think about all of the horrible, you know, news stories coming our way. Uh, of deaths on the Palestinian side, of harm to the Israelis, you know, any other advice that you have to caution prudent thinking as we face these, you know, this horrible conflict? Okay, yes, uh, certainly, Lila. Uh, first, we should be clear about our principles because we can be clear about our principles. No unjust, no direct killing, I'm sorry, no direct killing of innocent human beings. Um, the principle of proportionality. Now, when, when applying it, it's not clear, but at least the principle itself is clear. We know that's a sound and necessary principle. So let's be clear about the things we can be clear about. There are going to be other things that we're not going to be able to be very clear about. We're just going to be able to do the best we can. And those are really factual and prudential judgments. None of us is on the ground. None of us over here, thank God, are on the ground in uh, Israel and Palestine. And even people who are on the ground in Israel and Palestine are to a very considerable extent dependent on the media and on reports 
And even doing the best it can, and of course our media doesn't do the best it can, our media is so biased in so many ways, but even a media doing the best it can, it's going to get a lot of stuff wrong in what's called the fog of war. You've heard of the fog of war. Well, we got the fog of war big time right now. So, you know, we, we shouldn't believe everything we see. We shouldn't be impulsive. Uh, you know, when we, when we hear something, let's, let's not just jump to a conclusion that it's, that it's correct if facts are reported to us or alleged facts are reported to us. Um, let's make sure we have multiple sources of information. Should we be should we be particularly skeptical of anything coming from Hamas because they're the ones? Oh, you, you should, know, uh, they're uh, part of their creed is ju- unjust war. You know, and they're no. they're the ones announcing their casualties. They're claiming that Israel hit the hospital. Israel killed five hundred. Words come out it wasn't Israel. It's unclear how many people died, but it certainly wasn't five hundred. Uh, so I think that's, I've watched that in the Western media, you know, they, they're pouncing on anything, the ministry of war or the ministry of health, excuse me, in Gaza says, which is a Hamas arm and they report it and it's headline news for the whole country to now become enraged about or confused about. Don't believe a word Hamas says. It's a terrorist organization. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it does not have the interests of the Palestinian people at heart. In, in, in fact, as I said earlier in our conversation, the more they want more, not less Palestinian deaths. More Palestinian deaths helps their cause. So don't believe Hamas, but don't just implicitly or immediately believe anything you hear from anybody. The the U.S. government, the Israeli government, the New York Times, Fox News. Uh, you, even if they were doing their best, and they're not always doing their best. You know, politicians sometimes spin, and sometimes worse than spin. Media are often biased, more often than not biased these days. So, you know, make sure you have multiple sources of information. Don't just listen to one source or one side. Um, uh, don't jump to conclusions. Don't assume as soon as you hear a report that it's that it's true. Uh, try to you know maintain some distance there and some critical perspective. That's really the best we can uh, we can do. Just try to be thoughtful about these things. And then, of course, for those of us who are believers, whether we're Catholics or Protestants or Jews or Muslims, whatever our uh, faith, we, we need to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. We need to be praying for everybody involved over here, over there. There, there are decent people on all sides uh, who are caught up in this um, it is a complete nightmare, something most of us have never even remotely experienced and can't even can't even imagine. So the one thing we can all do is pray. And I think we really need to be about the business of, of prayer. This is what we regard as the Holy Land, the land where Jesus himself, when he was on earth with us in physical form, walked. Um, this is, as it happens, is the homeland of my own ancestors. My father's people come from that area, from Syria and Lebanon. Um, uh, I feel I have sort of a a little bit of a personal uh, stake in all this as well, but all of us are spiritually um, uh, invested uh, in that place where, 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 where Jesus walked, where the revelation of the Hebrew scripture was first given to the Jewish people, where Abraham, Abram became Abraham, uh, where, where, you know, St. Paul was born and where he began his, his, uh, his own work, um, uh, where our blessed mother Mary was born and lived her entire life and from which she was assumed into heaven as we Catholics believe. This is a very special place and look at it torn apart like this. Look at the suffering and the evil being perpetrated uh, over there. So, you know, let's think hard about things like just war theory. I, I, I do it all the time. I do it professionally. We all now, even if we're not professional philosophers, have to be doing it so that we can be good citizens. But it's even more important that we pray. Last question, if I may. What do you think is the appropriate response militarily of the United States from a just war perspective in assisting the war of an ally. And this is obviously very controversial right now on the left and the right. You know, should we militarily aid Israel? To what degree should we get involved? Many people do not want us to get involved at all. War is just something no one wants to even uh, in any way tolerate. 
What do you what is your what is your take on that? Well, just war theory is not going to give you a straight out answer on that one, <laughs> uh, Lila. I mean, it can only answer certain questions. Uh, and here we are in the area of prudence. So, assuming that all the criteria have been met for for for, for just war, as I believe in this case they uh, they have, uh, and assuming then that uh, that uh, Israel, uh, as the aggressed against party here. Uh, is uh, conducting itself in a, in, a, in a way that's consistent with just war uh, principles. And, and, and if they're not, it's our job to try to hold them as our allies uh, to it. We also have to be good allies uh, to them. Um, they have not requested U.S. military involvement, boots on the ground, soldiers. I don't think they will request them. If they did request them, that would be a very profound difficult prudential judgment that our own leadership would have to make, that our own public would either support or not or not support, but they will need other forms of uh, support, for both in terms of armament and strategic uh, assistance, and also in the uh, battle at the level of um, uh, publicity and ideas, because in no small measure because of the prevalence and widespread nature of anti-Semitism, um, uh, Israel is always vilified. The Jewish people are always vilified, and uh, they're attacked uh, in, in media all over the world. Lies are told about them. The infamous blood libels continue to this, to this day. Uh, efforts are made in international institutions to isolate them and to undermine their efforts and to damage them. And here the U.S., I think, needs to do its role as a good ally in, um, in stepping up there in solidarity with Israel and uh, and in, and in helping. And I think, um, you know, with respect to our own friends, and this would extend to our friends in the Palestinian and other Arab communities here in the United States, as well as to our Jewish friends, we have to be good friends. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to be neutral as to, you know, who's been aggressed against here and who is the uh, uh, aggressor. Hamas is the aggressor here. Israel has been aggressed against. But I think we have to be good friends uh, uh, to, our, uh, to our people. Uh, are to people in, of, of different faiths, uh, different ethnicities and, and traditions. Uh, but that always means, you know, being truthful. You're, you're, not, you're not a good friend when you're not truthful uh, to people. And uh, so I think we need to be truthful about who's being aggressed against and who's being aggressed. And we have to be truthful when we, when we condemn Hamas. And we have to be truthful if and when we think Israel has stepped out of line or done something that's uh, incorrect or improper. There's there's no guarantee that we're going to agree, uh, even when it comes uh, at least to some of the details of just war principles with the Israeli government, or that uh, the American Jewish community is going to agree with everything that the Israeli uh, government government does. But we just have to be honest and people of, people of goodwill. I do think we need to bear in mind the history here. And um, there is a terrible, dreadful history of animus and um, hatred, uh, for, for which Christians are in no small measure, you know, themselves responsible, Catholics, among other Christians, uh, of, of hatred of Jews. And um, let's not let that infect our community again, or in any way diminish our sense of what our responsibility is um, when it comes to standing in solidarity with the people that the late John Paul, St. Pope John Paul II called our elder brothers in faith, the people of the, as John Paul put it, the original covenant, our kindred nation, John Paul said, of the, uh, of the original covenant. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, that we should be biased uh, in favor of Jews and against uh, Palestinians. But I think it is worth keeping in mind that uh, anti-Semitism has a long history, including among us, and we don't want that playing any role in Catholic thinking or responses uh, to this to this situation. Let's be clear-headed as we can. Let's try to make the best prudential assessments that we can. And above all, Lila, let's be in prayer. It's such a good point, Dr. George. Thank you. And and also to remember, there's over 30 countries that Islam is their state religion. I think there's a dozen that's it's Christianity. There's only one in the whole on the whole planet uh, where it's Judaism, and that's the the newer nation of Israel with obviously its its ancient roots. And you know they they have been a long a long attacked people. So I, I thank you for recalling us to that context because I think many people are quick to forget it. In the long run. 
there does need to be a solution. I hope the long run won't be that long, but it seems to be getting worse and worse. It seems to be pushing further, being pushed further and further over the horizon. But in the long run, there has to be a solution to this that both Jews and Palestinians or other Arabs can live with. Um, you know, both sides have lots of claims against the other, grievances against the uh, the other, but the reality is that they are there together. And they're either going to spend the rest of the, 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 their time of existence uh, killing each other, or we're going to come up with some sort of some sort of uh, rapprochement. I, I, I myself would love to see a two-state solution. I know it's considered now to be almost like uh, almost uh, utopian to suppose there can be a two-state solution, but I don't see anything short of that that doesn't just end up in per- perpetual bloodshed. Um, you know, Israel cannot govern majority Palestinian areas. That's just not going to happen over the long run. Um, and, you know, the, the, it seems to me that, that even the strongest supporters of Palestinian claims should not imagine that they're going to get rid of Israel uh, because they're not. Um, so I would like as a matter of justice and also as a matter of peace to um, have a situation where you've got a flourishing, vibrant Palestinian state and a flourishing, vibrant Israel living in peace with each other, trading with each other, uh, uh, having cultural as well as economic interaction uh, and exchange with so much bitterness, especially based on so much bloodshed over the last 75 years, it's hard to envision that. And I can see why people think I'm crazy and I'm a utopian and I'm a loony visionary and so forth and so on. But I'm not going to give that vision or that hope up, Lila, because the, the, the alternative is just too unthinkable. Perpetual bloodshed, perpetual October the 7th, perpetual sieges of Palestine, per- perpetual bloodshed and evil. We just got to do better. I'm with you. I'm with you. And let's all pray together for the solution that brings peace and the justice to both the people of Israel and the people of Palestine. Thank you so much, Dr. George, for your time today. And it's it was wonderful. And um, thank you for your work, uh, your, your incredible work on fighting for life in this country and, and outside of it. Well, I appreciate that, Lila, uh, especially coming from uh, the person I consider the valedictorian of the pro-life movement. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast on Just War Theory with Dr. Robert George. I hope it was helpful for those listening and enlightening. Uh, As usual, I love your comments and your feedback. I read every email and I try to read every comment. You can email me at lila at gtbmedia.com. And as always, we love your support. We have a Patreon and you can become a patron at any amount to access special updates and content at the link in the bio. Thank you all so much and we'll see you next time.